All right, good evening, everyone, and welcome to uh, the next installment of Rev War Revelry here with Emerging Revolutionary War. Um, I am joined today by Dr. Lindsay Stravinsky, um, who is gracious in putting her reputation on the line by dealing uh, and coming on this talk. Uh, but Dr. Stravinsky is a early American historian, currently the scholar in residence at the Institute for Thomas Paine Studies at Iona College, and a senior fellow at the International Center for Jefferson Studies. In addition, because um, she has all this spare time, she teaches uh, courses on the presidency at George Washington University's School of Media and Public Affairs. I know we have a few George Mason uh, people that follow us, so don't get too upset. She went to other school uh, to teach in the DC area. But Dr. Zwinski, thank you uh, for joining us here tonight. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. So the uh, topic today is an, uh, her uh, amazing publication. If you haven't read it, uh, do so. Um, it's available on Amazon. Um, Perfect if you have a pet. Um, there's a whole thing on Inst I think Instagram or Twitter about reading it with your pet. But it's the cabinet, uh, George Washington and the creation of the American institution. Um, and so um, just finished it. Um, for actually made another read through of it this week to make sure I had uh, at least some intelligent conversation uh, to go with Lindsay. But um, what, let's, we'll start with these guys. What was the basis of writing this book? What, what drew you to the, the cabinet? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So I was doing my doctoral work and I knew that I wanted to do something about high politics. I've always been really fascinated by how um, a small group of people had so much power and influence. So I was the and the government. And I think that's because the government was so small, but also because it was new. And so one person could make such a huge impact. And um, so I knew that was sort of the area I wanted to study, but I didn't know what in particular. And so my advisor said, well, why don't you go read about the institution? I had read a lot about the people in the first administration, Jefferson, Hamilton, Washington, sort of the names we all know. Um, but I went to go look for books on the cabinet, the institution itself, and I couldn't find any. And I went back and I said, you know, I, I promise I'm not trying to shirk my work. I'm not trying to avoid duties, but I, I can't find anything. And initially, my advisor didn't really believe me um, and went and did his own search. And then he came back and he's like, oh, you're right. There actually isn't anything. And so I said, OK, well, I guess I'll I'll work on that and I'll um, answer the question of where it came from, because uh, the cabinet isn't in the Constitution and no legislation ever created it. And so I wanted to try and figure out where it came from and answer that question about how it evolved and why we still have it. And every president since has had it. And turns out I just got really lucky and there was this big gap in the scholarship that I didn't really know about. Um, and so then I spent the next like eight years crossing my fingers that no one would beat me to it. And thankfully no one did. Um, real quick, I uh, just want to show the book again because someone is interested in seeing the cover. So there it is, the cabinet with, uh, with Dr. Lindsay Stravinsky here. Uh, so Graham Webb, uh, hope you caught it that time, but uh, if not, it's on our uh, blog. So, um, so you've got the golden ticket and as they call it in history, this big yeah, so um, as you started it, um, where, oh, lead us down, if, for those who don't know how uh, these things happen, lead us down kind of your thought process or um, how the book, how do we get to the book from the dissertation, so. Sure, well, if you ask a historian um, how, you know, what is their process, and if you asked 100 historians, you'd get like 150 answers. There is no one right way to do it um, because the act of writing a dissertation is learning how to write a dissertation, which is sort of very weird and meta. Um, so what I did was I read everything I could find about the first administration. And usually that meant it was a biography or a dual biography, or maybe focused on a particular event. But that was my first step of trying to kind of get a sense of what the narrative chronology was like and what were the big events and the players. So I had a sense of you know who I was and what I was dealing with. Um, and then once I did that, I started exploring what were some other councils and advisory bodies that existed at the time, because obviously this didn't happen in a vacuum and um, Americans were deeply familiar with the British government, which did have a cabinet and the states had councils that advised their governor. So I started looking into what those meant and how those worked and where they came from. And I quickly discovered that the British cabinet and then the councils, usually they were called councils of state in the states, um, they had a, actually a very different purpose. 
So the councils of state were actually to limit the state governors. They were appointed by the legislature. They were paid by the legislature. And the governor was bound to ask for their advice and to follow it. So that was not something the first administration was trying to replicate because they wanted a much more powerful presidency. And then in terms of the British cabinet, as I was doing a bunch of research, which I was really lucky that I was able to kind of make that my secondary field, British history, and uh, make it very useful when I was going through this process. Um, I discovered that Americans were very distrusting of the British cabinet because they didn't really know who was in it or what was happening because all the meetings happened behind closed doors. And so they knew that it was a center of power, but they didn't have a real good sense about what was happening. And so they blamed the British cabinet for the things like the Stamp Act and the Intolerable Acts, things that fans of the revolution will know really sparked that conflict. And so Americans were very wary of trying to replicate that. So once I had those pieces sort of in order, I started going through the primary records, which were the letters that were drafted by the people who actually lived at that time. And for people who are fascinated by this history, I highly recommend you go to founders.archives.gov. And it has all of the digitized letters and transcribed, so it's easy to read, of Franklin, Adams, Washington, Hamilton, Madison. I think they just added John Jay. It is an unbelievable free resource. And so then I had to go through like 50,000 letters, um, but luckily you can do some, <laughs> you can do some keyword searching to sort of get you started and you can limit by dates and things like that. But um, I had a tragedy of riches uh, as a historian goes. I like that and, tragedy of riches. That yes, exactly. So then I, I pulled all that together and then I started writing and I, I did the dissertation but um, anyone who has sort of seen dissertation work knows that it looks very different than a book because you're writing that for experts. So they didn't need the backstory of Hamilton and Jefferson's relationship because they already knew that. And so it was really much more thematic. And I talked about sort of arguments and that kind of thing. So then when I was putting it together for a book, I wanted people to read it who weren't experts and I wanted people to be able to read it who didn't have a PhD in history. And so I rewrote it like five times, which I don't necessarily recommend as a best practice, but I just wanted to get it right. And um, so it took me a while, but I did rewrite it many, many times to get the story and the narrative arc right. And one, and, I'm, and for those who don't have PhDs like myself, I uh, appreciate the, uh, uh, the background story, even though we're um, knowledgeable in the subject, that whole being a part of how important the, the, the war years were in the creation. So something right there. Um, and before we get to uh, how many letters of Thomas Jefferson you actually had to get through, um, we, uh, what was the uh, surprising thing about um, Washington's experience in the Continental Army that you saw translated into forming the cabinet? What were the positives and maybe some of the things he overlooked? Yeah, so... Um, we tend to, when we're talking about Washington, we tend to either talk about Washington the general or Washington the president, and we keep them in really separate buckets. But that's kind of nonsensical because as humans, we don't operate in separate buckets. Of course, our previous experiences inform our actions on a day-to-day -day basis and how we think, how we talk to people, what decisions we make, that kind of thing. And Washington was no different. And so when I was trying to figure out where the cabinet came from, I had basically discarded all these alternatives that he looked at as examples. And so then I went back and I started to study his war years and what decisions he was making. And what I realized is I was seeing all of these extraordinary parallels. So for example, when he was convening a council of war with his officers and he wanted to get their advice about a retreat or a battle or where they should be for winter quarters, he followed a pretty strict pattern. He would send out a letter that had a bunch of questions. He would then use those questions as an agenda for the meeting. If the officers disagreed, he would ask for written opinions as a follow-up, as a way to make sure that he got all of the information he needed and he could study it clearly and sort of slowly in his own time to make sure he heard from everyone, he didn't miss anything. And then he would sometimes convene additional meetings if he wanted to try and build consensus. And I was seeing that exact same pattern in the cabinet. And so that was kind of a light bulb moment for me, which maybe should have come sooner than it did, which was like, oh, of course, he was pulling on the things that had worked really well for him during the war. 
And that was really his formative sort of adult um, transformative moment when he was figuring out who he was going to be as a leader. And so it's not surprising that he pulled some of those things. It perhaps was just surprising how long it took me to figure that out. Um, and surprising that other people hadn't drawn more connections because so many people that were in the first federal government had served in the war. And so I think those experiences were really transformative. And it's something, I mean, we blast George Washington in these councils of war all the time, because as I forget what historian said, or uh, general said, councils of war never fight. Uh, but Washington, I mean, uses that council of war thing. So that's kind of a, a negative put on his generalship, but it's actually a positive that he brings into the presidency. Now, um, let's talk, I mean, one of my favorite character or personas of that time frame is Henry Knox. So um, let's spend a minute on um, uh, Henry Knox. Do you, uh, in your his, uh, research, did you see, um, how, how does he grow from just a bookseller to, um, I mean, he's really a Secretary of War even before the first cabinet. So, I mean, he has a lot of experience in the political realm, correct or am I wrong? Yeah, no, that's right. So Henry, I had you know, I wanted to write a good book, but then I sort of had these other personal goals that were sort of secret behind the scenes. And one of them was that I wanted people to pay attention to Knox more because he was a central figure from basically 1775 until 1794. And um, he was at the heart of power the entire time. And so from the very beginning, Washington and Knox just clicked. I think Washington really appreciated that Knox's perspective about most things was, sure, I can do that. And then he would figure out how to accomplish the task. So for example, getting cannons down from Fort Ticonderoga in the winter of 1775 was no easy task and he managed to do so. And those cannons turned out to be essential for forcing the British out of Boston. And um, that wasn't like he had experience dragging cannons in the middle of winter, he just kind of figured it out as he went. And Knox, I think that Washington really appreciated that about Knox. Um, so he was definitely one of Washington's most trusted generals. He ended up being the major general of artillery. And so really one of like the top lieutenants to Washington during the war. And he was rewarded for that service by then becoming the commander of West Point, which was a very choice position as the war ended up. And from that point, he then was appointed as the Secretary of War under the Confederation Congress. And so he oversaw all negotiations with Native American nations as the new country tried to sort of establish treaties and diplomatic ties. He oversaw all the state militias and tried to implement militia reform. And so he was a central figure, not that there was a whole lot of power in Congress, but if there was, he held it. And he knew Congress well, and that was experience that Washington found to be really helpful. And so when Washington was ready to appoint a secretary of war, Knox was an obvious choice because one, he had served admirably in that position already, but he was also one of Washington's best friends. And so why wouldn't you appoint someone that you trust intimately into that position? And they worked really closely, especially the first couple of years as Washington was really focused on relationships with Native American nations. That was a huge part of the first couple of years, which most people I think don't really appreciate. Um, there's actually a great book by Colin Calloway called George Washington, The Indian World of George Washington or George yeah. Washington's Indian World. Um, and it really focuses on this topic and Knox is a central character. I think the reason we don't remember Knox quite as well as we did are, is twofold. One, he retired at the end of 1794 and Washington was kind of annoyed at the way he retired. He had gone to Maine to deal with sort of some personal issues and dilly dallied on his way back. I think he was really tired. He had been in public service for at this point, you know, um, over almost 20 years and hadn't really been home much. And I think he just really wanted to, to go back and be a private citizen, but didn't do that first. And so instead he was sort of shirking his duties and Washington found that unacceptable because he never, you know, really thought, saw himself as shirking his duties. So that's part one. They kind of had a thawing or a, um, a chilling of their relationship. Part two is that Jefferson left all these records about cabinet meetings and all these notes about their conversations. And he would often say that basically Knox was just Hamilton's toady. And he went along with whatever, not, whatever Hamilton had to say and didn't have any original ideas. What didn't occur to Jefferson was that not, if Hamilton had this military experience that 
informed his ideas about nationalism and government power. Knox had twice as much of that experience and perhaps came to the same opinions because of his own past, but Jefferson couldn't really see that multiple people might agree with him and or disagree with him and agree with Hamilton. So that's kind of colored our understanding of, of Knox's central role and something that I really tried to push back on. I really appreciate that. I mean, the more um, the writing a little bit on, on the Boston campaign for introductory books and, and so forth, you hear, I mean, Knox is kind of like Washington. He's a self-made uh, man, I mean, bookseller and so forth. And Well, and I think just, that's one of the reasons they were really close is they were both self-educated. And so they understood what that was like. They uh, grow up. And then, I mean, uh, Knox's wife, uh, someone said um, Knox deserves a musical. So uh, do you agree that Knox should be the next musical or should we switch to Jefferson or something else? So. There's a tough question for you. You should be the next musical out of that first cabinet. Yeah, well, I mean, I would like to I would like to think that he could come up with his he deserves his own form of creative medium <laughs> to share his life story, but he had an incredible fascinating life and even sort of a equally colorful death. He died because he sort of choked on a chicken bone and it got infected and so I mean like that's a really horrible but also like very unique way to go. And so he would, he was an extraordinary person and a, a very colorful person. And Lucy was equally so because she was apparently the life of the party and super warm. And her family was um, strict loyalists. So by marrying Knox, she was sort of breaking with the family tradition. And so it is a, it was a very colorful story for sure. So for any of those future producers out here, you heard it first. Uh... Uh, Lindsay said he needs a creative medium, but do not follow the same route as Hamilton. <laughs> we kind of heard that. Yeah, something new and different. New and different. So um, we also had a, a question come in from one of our loyal followers, Mike Peters, about Edmund Randall. Um, so we uh, always hear about uh, Jefferson and Hamilton. So we'll obviously spend some time, but let's talk about round out the cabinet. So Edmund Randolph um, is there. Um, what's your uh, what's your take on those? For, and don't give too much away of the book. I don't want people not to to buy the book, but uh, give them well, the, thank you. The, the yes. So, so the unspoken heroes of the book are definitely Knox and Randolph. Um, they, for as much as I cared about uh, lifting up Knox's reputation, I cared about doing so equally with Randolph because he's even lesser known because he doesn't really have that revolutionary war Ticonderoga story. Um, but he was Washington's aide de camp in the early years of the war. Then he went back to Virginia and served in a number of local positions, including the attorney general and the governor of Virginia, and was Washington's private lawyer that entire time. So they were very close. And he was instrumental in getting Washington to go to the Constitutional Convention, and then was instrumental in kind of getting Washington to serve, although he kind of at that point had agreed he had to. Um, and they had a really close relationship. And while I don't want to give away all the details, in once Hamilton and Jefferson and Knox had all retired by January 1795, Knox was the only one left. And Washington definitely thought less of the replacements. I affectionately refer to them as the B team based on Washington's sort of own writings and assessments of their talents and abilities. And so Randolph played this incredibly important role where he and Washington were keeping secrets from the rest of them and um, was an essential second secretary of state. And so again, we, we partly don't remember him because of the way he resigned, which um, you'll have to read about that, um, that incident, but the way he resigned and then also what Jefferson said about him because Jefferson often wrote in his notes that the cabinet meetings would split two and a half to one and a half votes. And that was sort of a knock on the fact that Randolph tended to sort of go back and forth between the two sides and Jefferson hated that wishy-washiness. But again, Jefferson couldn't fathom that someone might sometimes disagree with him and instead viewed that as Randolph's indecisiveness. Uh, and you made a point about the, the B team. Now is Randolph a better care, uh, better persona because he's a all-star with the B cast or he's, is he outshone with the, the A cast? And no offense to the B cast, you're following I mean, one of the best cabinets ever created in the, uh, I mean, maybe second, with, we can argue, uh, if you know anything about Lincoln's cabinet, we could say who was the <laughs> yeah. cabinet, but um, I mean, to give some due to that, the B team, where does Randolph, uh, is, he, is it because the B team, he's a more luminary than the B team, or is he outsh outshone by the A team, in your opinion? 
Yeah, it's a great question. So, I mean, to give you a sense of how much the B team was the B team, Washington asked six people to be his secretary of state before settling on Timothy Pickering, which Pickering knew, which could not have um, <laughs> endeared him to good relationships with the president. Um, but in terms of Randolph, he was absolutely a part of the A-team and he was so well respected as a legal mind and a legal scholar that the other secretaries would often ask for his input on matters of legislation or a diplomatic question or a constitutional issue. Even Hamilton and Jefferson, who were lawyers and had been trained and had been practicing lawyers. And so they just, they respected what he had to say and they respected the way he thought about things. And so while he didn't have a department because the Department of Justice wasn't formed until 1870, uh, he was an essential part of that first conversation. And in fact, I have a little note that I dropped in the footnotes that I refer to them as the secretaries, even though the attorney general wasn't technically a secretary at that point because Washington treated them as equals. And so I like to do so in my writing to honor sort of how he treated them. That's actually important. I mean, like, um, as we said in the post, and, um, and I um, uh, thank you for the edits and everything uh, for that, because I want to make sure I, I got the initial part right, because we do assume that it's either in the Constitution or because we like to look at the lens of every president's had a cabinet, it mm -hmm. must have been there. But I mean, those are things even from the wording of the secretary. So. Um, the, Senator Freeman, what are those interest, um, things that we take for granted with the cabinet that came out uh, as you did the, the research uh, that the average person on the street probably wouldn't, wouldn't know? Yeah, well, so even most historians don't know this. When they, um, when they talk about the cabinet, when they talk about the first administration, they assume that it was there from day one in the presidency because the people who were in the first cabinet, Hamilton, Jefferson, Knox, and Randolph, were the same people that were in office as of January 1790. And so they assume, well, if they were if they were there, then clearly they were meeting and talking in person. And that's really not the case. Initially, Washington really stuck to the letter of the constitution and exchanged only written advice with them. But that quickly proved to be inefficient and not make a whole lot of sense because what if you have follow-up questions or things come up that you really need to have that kind of conversation. So then he started doing one-on-one -on -one consultations after they would exchange a round of letters. And it wasn't until November 26th, 1791, which is two and a half years into Washington's presidency that he actually convened a cabinet meeting with everyone in one place. And that's pretty extraordinary because that means that A, he wasn't intending to create a cabinet when he first went into the presidency. And B, he really tried all of these other options before turning to that solution. So that's a really big part that people generally don't know. The second part that people generally don't know is at the end of Washington's presidency, when he did have this B team, he really turned away from cabinet meetings and he would occasionally convene them if there was like a big precedent setting issue like executive privilege. But he by and large preferred to have one-on-one -on -one consultations written correspondence, or he would consult with people outside of the administration like Hamilton or John Jay. And that was really essential because what that meant was that the cabinet didn't have an institutional right to be a part of the decision-making process. They were only welcome when the president invited them. And that is a critical legacy that has shaped pretty much every president since because presidents get to decide when they include the cabinet and how often they're going to take their advice or if they're going to take advice from other people. And while the cabinet, of course, has changed and expanded and evolved, and you know, there are many more departments, that legacy actually remains the same. So um, no, it's, I mean, you we assume, yeah, it's it's there from day one. And then he's having these meetings and so forth. Um, but I mean, it even takes what Jefferson time to travel back. I think he's overseas or somewhere else at the beginning and, and so forth. So um and there's, uh, so I'd like to read it, there's first cabinet meetings. Um, as you're reading through all these, this fountain of letters uh, that you did, um, did anything strike out about what were their views of being part of this first cabinet? They realized they were making history or, or not? Yeah, so um, in the first couple of letters, there isn't much conversation about it, but by 1792, people are starting to refer to it as the cabinet. And by 1793, people are starting to ask questions about what conversations are taking place. There's a really fascinating letter that Madison sends to Jefferson saying like, 
why didn't this come up in the cabinet meetings? Um, and that's pretty fascinating because that shows that one, there is sort of widespread knowledge that this is taking place and um, that it's not a public institution and people are not privy to this information. Um, and they're also calling it the cabinet, which is really fascinating, except for Washington. Washington refuses to use the word cabinet until he retires, which is really fascinating because the minute he retires, he refers to it as John Adams cabinet. But in his own writings, he referred to them as the gentlemen of my family or the secretaries. And of course, he didn't ever really say why, but I speculate that he didn't want to encourage any comparison between his administration and the British cabinet. Um, but that's one of those things we'll never really know unless someone invents a time machine. Um, but so that was, you know, that was one of the things that I found to be particularly interesting um, because it showed a, an understanding that they knew that they were partaking in this thing and um, were okay with it. And so, and the kind of, I mean, one of the, um, and maybe this is outside the, uh, the purview of the uh, research, but um, from the great HBO series from John Adams, we hear about him complaining about the vice presidency. Um, <laughs> is that uh, pretty transparent in anything you came across? Because he's not part of the cabinet, correct? He's kind of yeah. to be there. Or? No, that's a, it's a really important point. So um, I have found no evidence that Adams ever participated in a cabinet meeting. Washington did send him a series of letters in the first year of his presidency, and then in sort of the final years of his presidency, asking for advice on particular issues. They also socialized regularly. Adams regularly went to the theater with Washington. He often attended state dinners at Washington's house. They sometimes went riding or went to go visit gardens. So they did see each other a lot. And it's very possible that they talked about some of these issues, but we don't really know because of course those conversations weren't captured, but there's no evidence that Adams ever attended a cabinet meeting. And um, unfortunately we don't really know why. There are sort of two hypotheses that are out there among historians. The first is that Washington saw Adams as part of the legislative branch because he was uh, the president of the Senate in his capacity as vice president. And so he didn't want to obscure the separation of powers and was uncomfortable with that. I don't find that argument particularly compelling because he did send these letters and ask for his advice. And um, I think we can assume that there was probably at least some conversation going on. So I don't find that quite as compelling. He also was willing to send Chief Justice John Jay to go negotiate treaties on behalf of the president. So I'm not sure that he had the same <laughs> attention to separation of powers as we're um, attributing to him 200 years later. The second argument, which I think is probably the more likely one, is in the summer of 1789, Congress was trying to figure out what to call the president. And Adams proposed this sort of insane title that was like his highness and mighty protector of our liberties or something like that. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's so long that you kind of have to take a breath in the middle of it. And um, that was a, a highly unpopular position. Most people felt that that was too monarchical and they needed something simple like his excellency, which is what uh, governors and generals were referred to as, or just Mr. President, which is of course what we um, ended up with. So it's possible that, and we know Washington didn't like this long title because he did write that in his private letters. So I think he didn't trust Adam's um, political judgment and didn't really want to be associated with that. Um, so that is my that is my best guess. And given that they didn't have a particularly close relationship before, um, Adams was, I think, a little envious of Washington's stature. And Adams had been critical of Washington's leadership during the war, which Washington knew about. So they weren't exactly best buds to begin with. It wasn't uh, because Adams was more of a talker and Washington wasn't. So, uh, <laughs> well, he also would have had a lot to say in the cabinet meetings, that's for sure. Oh, no, um, and uh, I don't uh, kind of segue if you don't mind into some of this. We got a great uh, question in, um, and I don't want to say it in our comments, but it's uh, from Jim Walsh, who says, what captured your initial interest in this period? Because he's trying to get his daughter more interested in history and in the revolution in particular, and um, he wants to ask a, uh, a female luminary that is um, uh, here on. So before we uh, get too far down, yeah, what did capture your initial interest and words of advice for a aspiring um, historian. Yeah, well, um, I don't know how old she is, but um, 
I read a ton of historical fiction as a kid and I found books that were written in the first person uh, historical narratives to be incredibly compelling. They were obviously fiction, but um, I, I was fascinated by trying to understand how people lived at a different time. And in some ways it feels very similar. People care about their family, they fall in love, they're stressed about things. So there are a lot of elements of life that are quite similar, but there are, there are elements as well that are so foreign. You know, there's no running water, there's no electricity, um, there isn't modern medicine. And so there are, there are aspects of figuring out life that just feel completely foreign. And so I found that to be so fascinating to try and envision what it was like to live at a different time. And that's really what captured my interest in history. And my mom was a big proponent of doing something cultural anytime we went on a, on a trip. So that could be a museum, it could be historic sites. So we went to a lot of historic sites. And I think that only facilitated that interest because I was able to see homes and towns and places that people had lived and try and figure out what how I would have operated. And um, it may not come as a surprise to anyone watching this that I've, you know, I've always had something to say and I've always had an opinion. And so trying to imagine what it would have been like to be a woman in the 17th or 18th century is often mind boggling. And so I was fascinated by that. And um, I think my parents encouraged that through the, the reading of historical fiction and then through movies and things like that. And it doesn't have to be the Revolutionary War period. That doesn't capture everyone's attention. But um, I think that sort of experiential learning, if you, can, if you can make that happen, I think that that's always a huge, a huge plus. And then whatever, whatever period it is that captures her attention, just run with it. So you're saying that if you were in the 18th century, you would have been hanging out with Abigail Adams. With <laughs> and calling, yeah, I think I would have, have gotten in a lot of trouble. Um, <laughs> yes, I, I, um, I, uh, I would have been quite feisty. I still am quite feisty. Um, it, I would have been, I would have loved to be, to be friends with Abigail Adams. I, I, she could turn quite a phrase and had a quite a sharp tongue, which I appreciate, but the, um, and her, her marriage was actually quite, I don't know if you guys, if you, if you don't know this, but there's an incredible book by Woody Holton on Abigail Adams. And it talks about her unbelievable financial savvy. And basically when John was gone during the war, he turned over all of their finances to her and she became the sort of master speculator and trader with a T R A D E R not trader. Yeah. And, um, she did all of these ingenious schemes and was way more creative and financially inclined than he was, but that was a very atypical marriage. And so um, 20th, 21st century marriages are, I think, much more my style. <laughs> no, no, I mean, you're speaking to our audience. Anytime you recommend books, I mean, obviously you can see behind you, behind me. Yes, um, yeah, absolutely. behind anyone. Uh, we like to spend other people's money on publications. So that's why. Uh, sure. Um, because more you always well, and more. I see, I just noticed you have um, the three cornered war up on oh. your shelf, and Megan's a good friend of mine, so I'm thrilled to see that. Oh, yeah, no, I uh, I have an interest in the history on, on the periphery of things. Um, and um, actually bought that the first day it came out in uh, South Florida, so got the only copy in uh, the Barnes and Noble down there. So excellent, uh, she'll be thrilled to hear it. But, um, as we're talking about, um, and we'll switch back to the cabinet because I know if we go down the same way of books, we can do that at the end because uh, I do want to send to our uh, audience some of the books you recommend uh, besides your own, of course. Um, but uh, you uh, gave me a quote for the post that said, the best way to understand the creation of the presidency, presidential leadership or Washington's legacy is through the cabinet. Kind of a, a powerful quote because, I mean, Washington's legacy is a very big thing, uh, to put it uh, simply. So um, let's unpack that. Um, where, uh, where, where should we start with the creation of the presidency, presidential leadership, or do you want to take the big elephant in the room first, uh, the Washington? <laughs> um, let's start Washington's presidency. So um, I highly encourage everyone, anytime I give a talk, I highly encourage everyone to actually look at the text of Article 2, um, which is the part of the Constitution that deals with the presidency. And it is extraordinarily short especially compared to the other articles. And um, so there's really just not that much written down about what the day-to-day -day actions of the presidency are going to be, how uh, the president is supposed to comport himself or herself, 
how the president is supposed to interact um, on a day-to-day -day basis with the other branches or how the president is supposed to use any of these powers that are given to him or her. And so that was really up to Washington to figure out, which was just an enormous task. I mean, we cannot stress enough how huge of a task it was to actually create this office and create the executive branch essentially from scratch. And certainly Washington played a huge role in this, but the cabinet was by his side and with him and a part of all of these decisions. So when the president was trying to figure out what his role was over foreign policy and during the neutrality crisis in 1793, the cabinet is the one that's meeting with Washington and trying to figure out these details and making recommendations and encouraging Washington to advocate for strong executive authority and advocate for um, sort of an energetic executive that is going to take the lead and push policy. And not because they are going to get more power from it, but because the president is going to get more power from it and it's going to leave more power for Washington's successors. The same thing is true during the Whiskey Rebellion in 1794 over domestic policy. The cabinet is pushing Washington to take action, which sidelines the state governments and Congress and leaves this precedent that the president has this extraordinary authority over domestic issues. And again, that's really the cabinet's creation on behalf of the president. They're not seizing authority for themselves. And so as we think about sort of what, I call it the fuzzy bits of the presidency as those are getting fleshed out, the cabinet is at the center of that. And when we understand presidential history, now expanding it out from there, because every president has had a cabinet since Washington, every big moment in presidential history, if you read into that, usually the cabinet is right there in the center. And maybe not every single cabinet secretary, but some of them. And so you cannot understand the president's role in the development of American history without understanding those interactions. Because those interactions don't take place in a vacuum. They don't take place in these you know, perfectly vacuum sealed bags. There are people who are interacting with each other within the confines of this institution. And um, so you have to understand what those interactions look like and how the institution is playing a role. And so that is sort of when I think about Washington's legacy, that is a part that people really don't appreciate is that it didn't have to be that way. You know, it could have been that one of the secretaries were, you know, originally from Congress and sort of served as an unofficial prime minister or the president worked with someone in Congress as an unofficial prime minister, or the vice president became an unofficial prime minister. There were so many other ways that it could have shaken down and it didn't. And so that is a huge thing that we have to appreciate about what Washington left behind. And I think is so often overlooked. And then in terms of understanding how presidents work, Managing the cabinet, because there is no legislation that governs it, there's no sort of written rules, it can be an incredible asset. If, if a president is good at managing that flexibility and working with the personalities that he has selected, like Lincoln and FDR, they were phenomenal at um, getting the best out of the people that worked with them. And sort of sometimes FDR would like play off his secretaries off each other to see who could come up with the best solution. And that worked great for them. But most presidents are not that good at it because it is a nearly impossible task. Secretaries tend to be incredibly well-educated. They tend to be very opinionated. They tend to be used to being listened to. They're probably pretty ambitious. And so managing that group of people is like herding cats. And so most presidents are not that good at it. And sometimes they kind of ignore them and it's a problem like Madison, or sometimes the secretaries are sort of treacherous like Adams. Um, but more often than not, they kind of just get in the way or they're divisive or they undermine administration's um, efficacy. And so, or sometimes they're, you know, flat out catastrophic, but the cabinet is the best way to understand a president's legacy because if a, if a president is really good at managing the cabinet, you're probably not gonna see it and you're not gonna really pay attention to the cabinet. And if, the cab if a president is bad at it, then there are gonna be news stories every single day about various nefarious deeds. And we're uh, stressing keeping this in 18th century about uh, cabinets and then presidencies, uh, especially um, with today's political climate, that's enough said there. Um, but I mean, that's something we don't take into account is, uh, I mean, we always say Washington has this great 
cabinet of luminary them, how awesome would have been to have been a fly on the wall. But we don't take that. They are also everyone that's used to being listened to. I mean, um, Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson, especially. Um, I mean, both demanded uh, attention that way. So um, is that one, is that Washington's shining moment as, uh, in, this, in your view as the cabinet is managing just a cabinet meeting? Um, is that, uh, what was Washington as a cabinet meeting manager, I guess we should say? How, how was his role if someone doesn't understand what Washington was like in a meeting besides outside the military? Sure. Well, Washington designed the cabinet to be um, most effective for him. And he, what, what that meant was he wanted to get as much information and advice out of his secretaries as possible. And so he liked it when Hamilton and Jefferson sort of went at it and were super combative in the cabinet meetings because it was a way for the two of them to sort of stress test each other's ideas and they could poke the holes in their arguments and so he didn't have to and he could just sit back he could listen he could take in all of the information from these incredibly smart well-educated you know re well-reasoned men and try and make the most informed decision possible and um, so that worked really well for him. That was what he wanted from the institution. Now, the problem was that Jefferson despised it and he hated conflict and he didn't want any part of it. And so he, um, he started talking about retirement in early 1792 and Jefferson, or excuse me, and Washington convinced him to stay until early 1793. And then the war broke out in Europe and he basically was so bucked down by the neutrality crisis that he stayed until the end of the year. But so he hated that. And when he had his own cabinet, he drew from the best of Washington's example, but then really tried to avoid that same conflict. So when I think of Washington's cabinet management, it certainly was the best option for him, but I don't necessarily think of it as the shining moment of his presidency. Instead, what I think of the shining moment of Washington's presidency is the fact that he, he showed up and he was there. And um, there was no one else that could fill that position because there wasn't really nationalism at that time. The flag didn't have the same sort of symbolic meaning. And Washington was that person. And he was the person that um, could bring people together and hold the nation together as it tried to establish sort of very tenuous emotional ties among the different sections. And so showing up and being there and knowing when to exercise restraint knowing when not to say something and not to respond and when to retire. Those were huge decisions and they're much harder decisions to quantify. And they're much less sexy than winning a civil war or winning World War II. But um, I don't think that the nation and the presidency would exist without it. I mean, that's a, a great point that we uh, take for, I mean, for granted how lucky we are that under Washington resigned after two terms. I think it's in your epilogue as you uh, kind of discuss some of the, the follow-up through. So um, what uh, other, uh, besides, I mean, everyone likes to uh, paraphrase Washington's farewell speech about the two things we're not supposed to do. And also um, people may dig a little deeper and say Washington's legacy of, of retiring after two terms kept until 1940s with FDR and then the amendment there. But is there any other legacies that are um, more nuanced that wouldn't be picked up um, that you found out as you wrote this book? Yeah, so there are two that I think are really essential. The presidency is supposed to represent all Americans. It's the only person in office that um, is really uh, a representative of all people. Um, all others are, you know, state or locally based. And Washington understood the symbolic value of that, of that position and that role. And so he did a couple of national tours. He went first, he went north to the Northern states with the exception of Rhode Island because they had not yet uh, ratified the constitution in the fall of 1789. And then he went back and visited them with them once they did. Um, and then he went south um, through the Southern states. And what he would do is he would go down on the Eastern side and come back on the Western side or vice versa. And um, this was a really intentional choice because in the 1790s, most people didn't interact with the federal government all that much. They didn't have a reason to, except for maybe the post office and the post service. And so Washington um, wanted the people to see him they wanted, he wanted, he wanted them to know that the federal government existed. He wanted 
to try and bring the federal government to them. He wanted to build emotional ties between this very new, uh, this very new system and the American people. He wanted them to feel seen and heard and a part of something bigger. But he also wanted to see the American people. He wanted to see what industry different towns were focused on, what crops they were growing, what fish they were fishing, what um, products they were producing, what did architecture look like, what did art look like, what was the food like. And that was really important to him, even when it was really uncomfortable and really unpleasant, because especially in the South, there weren't very many good roads and they were very dusty and there weren't very many um, attractive public accommodations. And so he often stayed in really crap places. And that was not fun, but this was a, um, it was a symbolic gesture to, to reach out to the American people. And it was one that the American people understood. So that was the first part. And we see echoes of that, you know, throughout the American experience where presidents will go visit different areas and try and bring the federal government to different towns and states. The second part was, um, what it meant to be um, a republic um, or a virtuous Republican, and this is little r Republican at the time, what it meant to be a virtuous Republican was kind of undefined. Um, all republics had failed previously and they, Americans had to basically craft a culture from scratch. And so where do you start with that? That's such a sort of amorphous idea. Where do you even begin? And so he knew it couldn't be monarchical because that would be frowned upon because they just fought this war. But he also knew that he couldn't really be a country bumpkin because he was going to be hosting foreign ministers from Versailles and the court of St. James. And so they were used to a certain level of splendor. And so he had to try and find this middle ground to balance out respect um, that would be instilled from, from both American citizens and foreign visitors, but also Republican, and this is again, little r Republican values. And so he experimented with a bunch of different ways to do this. So for example, he was the first president to wear American made to his inauguration. He had a American made homespun suit, a very nice homespun, but American made homespun suit made for his inauguration and balanced it out with some diamond shoe buckles because he liked a little bit of uh, sparkle and flash. Similarly, he had the fanciest coach in all of North America. It was cream colored with gold trim and anyone who has a white car knows what happens when you go for a drive and the weather's not very good. So this was a symbol of wealth and prestige that he had enough wealth that he could own enough enslaved individuals to clean the coach every time he took it outside. He also had um, six matching horses and the enslaved men that drove and tended to the coach had matching uniforms. So this was a statement and a half and everyone knew the coach belonged to him and everyone knew who it was when it went down the street. But then on the other hand, he took daily walks and in the afternoon, this was not for exercise because he preferred to ride. In the afternoon, he would take a walk first around New York City and then in Philadelphia. And the point was to demonstrate that his boots got muddy too. And what that meant was that he was no different than an average citizen. And to us, that might not be something we would pick up on, but 18th century Americans understood the message he was trying to convey, which was that he was no better than anyone else. And so today we still see echoes of that where presidents are you know, trying to make sure that people respect the American nation, but where you buy your clothes from and where you get your entertainment and your reading and your music are a demonstration of American values. It seems like Washington missed out on a uh, great opportunity for a slogan campaign. Uh, my boots get muddy too. <laughs> exactly. Um, everything. Um, uh, we do have another uh, question that just came in, um, and uh, it's about Henry Knox. Um, uh, it's obviously Washington, military general, leader of the army, Knox, general, now secretary of war. Um, what was the relationship between Washington, um, Wayne, or, um, Knox, and say like Anthony Wayne or the general, like did Washington stay out of military affairs, uh, leaving it to Knox, or um, did he feel the need to chime in because, well, he kind of won a war, so he knows a little bit. Of, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, so Washington did an interesting mix of uh, delegating and micromanaging. He was very aware of everything that was going on in all the departments. He expected official correspondence to pass through his desk and they would send him drafts and he would give edits and then 
send them back and they would send the revised version out officially. So he knew everything that was happening and he was instrumental in selecting once Arthur St. Clair had his terrible defeat, he was instrumental in working with Knox to select who was going to be the replacement. And initially they weren't wild about Wayne because he had a little bit of a drinking problem and was known as being sort of reckless, but basically decided they didn't really have a choice because there wasn't anyone better. So um, he did certainly delegate certain things to the different departments, but he was also very much aware of what was going on. And in that particular instance was very active in making that decision, because as you said, he knew who all the generals were. They, if they had any military experience, they had served under him. So he knew who they were and was very much a part of that decision. So there, um, very much. Um, and so as we uh, wrap up here, I can't believe it's already been almost an hour, but uh, um, this is one of the reasons we started is historian happy hour. So we try to keep uh, to uh, an hour. Um, so we appreciate your time. But what is, uh, without giving too much money in the book, what is one, th one thing you want to point out to our readers, kind of a, maybe a hook to the book or something fascinating about the cabinet? and making sure people understand that it, it is uh, worth reading, not a 21st century political uh, history book, so. Yeah, absolutely. No, I mean, it is a history book. It is not, it is not journalism. Um, there is one paragraph, I will give you a heads up, there's one paragraph, just one, in the epilogue that talks about um, facts only, how the current cabinet compares to previous precedents. It's one paragraph. The rest of it is all, 18th century. Um, and it, um, I think what I would say is that you can't, again, to stress this point, you cannot understand Washington's administration, which is a pretty well known story at this point, without understanding the central role of the cabinet. And so even if you've read a ton about these guys, which my guess is if you're watching this, you probably have, um, by centering the cabinet, I, my hope is that you will take something new away from it. And I think you probably will, because I've heard from a bunch of historians who know the subject matter well, that positioning the cabinet at the center actually does reveal some new information about the interactions and the way decisions were made and um, helps you understand sort of the interpersonal relationships, which are, I think, at the heart of any history book, but especially one like Washington's where the first administration is such a small group of people that if you don't know how they're interacting and, and what that story looks like, you can't fully understand the decisions they made and the events that they influenced. Uh, and full disclosure is that um, I, uh, uh, Lindsay and I are friends on social media. So I did pick up that there was a, I think a review that someone said about uh, that. And so I wanted to give you a chance to our audience to explain that there is exactly one paragraph. <laughs> Exactly. People are very angry about, so I have to explain. So for me as a historian, um, I think that the most valuable thing about history is that um, it helps us understand our current moment. And we can't understand our government if we don't understand where it came from. And we can't understand our political culture if we don't understand where it came from. And that doesn't mean we all have to agree, but we should know, we should know the origins and we should know the history. And so I like to explain how that uh, precedent has evolved and how things maybe have changed from precedent. And mostly I contain that to my op-eds and some of my other political writings, but I felt like it was really important to include one paragraph of um, some of the precedents that have changed. And some people have been very angry about that, um, including someone who accused me of being a propagandist, but I promise that's not the case. Um, I promise you will not think it's propaganda. Uh, it's one paragraph. One paragraph, and I mean, and also you uh, have in your um, uh, biography as well that um, I mean, you do work the Thomas Paine with studies, and you have Jefferson. So if you're gonna be a little bit of a rouser, I mean, you have <laughs> exactly. I have I have really good historical backing, um, so, but yeah. Let's uh, for, so we'll wrap up with that. Um, what is the Thomas? I mean, I'm in the history field. I work for the National Park Service, and I'll admit I have not heard of the. What is the Thomas Paine Institute of uh, or Institute of Thomas Paine Studies? I can't get the I don't have the name in front of me right now, but yeah, uh, no. Well, it's actually it's a fairly new um, institute, so I don't blame you for not knowing. It's based out of Iona College, um, which is in New Rochelle, and the reason it's based there is because when Thomas Paine came back from France, that's where he settled was in New Rochelle, New York, and the idea is really to look at Thomas Paine's lifetime. 
So not just Thomas Paine, but what happened in this age of revolutions. And there is so much that happened because it's the American Revolution and the French Revolution and the Haitian Revolution. And he had so much to say about all of those things. And so um, it really takes a very broad look. And one of the things that I love about the Institute is that they are so supportive and encouraging of innovative history, whether it's podcasts or digital projects or scholarship or op-eds, whatever it is, if it's a way to get historical information to a broad public, they love it. And so that is very much up my alley and sort of my mission as well. And um, so I'm very grateful that they have uh, taken a chance on me and given me an opportunity to continue to do the work that I love. And um, I view it as a great opportunity to then be able to tell people about the Institute for Thomas Paine Studies. So it's a, it's a good partnership and um, we have lots of, lots of good things coming. So maybe uh, I think uh, that we might need to talk on another Zoom upcoming on uh, the Thomas Paine Institute because uh, I think we could be here another hour. Uh, we don't want to um, put the horse before the cart or cart before the horse. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, before we forget, before we sign off, I do want to, you mentioned the sort of pet themed, but I just wanted to share a bit. Um, some of you may know that George Washington was a huge dog lover. And in fact, he loved dogs so much that he actually created the American foxhound breed. He bred English foxhounds with French foxhounds that were sent to him as a gift by the Marquis de Lafayette. So in honor of that, um, in 2014, I actually adopted a dog and I named him John Quincy Dog Adams, Quincy for short. And so in honor of both my love of hounds and Washington's love of hounds, I created a book plate because I obviously can't sign books in person at this point. And this is what the book plate looks like. Can you see the hound? There we go. Yeah. So, um, so anyway, so I created a book plate and I actually found out a couple of months ago that the person who brought the hounds to Washington from France was none other than John Quincy Adams. So it was completely fate and meant to be and blew my mind. But if you go to my website, which is lindsaytravinsky.com, and there's a special page, it's lindsaytravinsky.com slash book dash plate. Um, you can put your information. And if you've purchased the book, I will send you a signed book plate, a personalized signed book plate to thank you for reading it and being interested in history. And it's the best way that I can think of to connect with readers during this pandemic time. Perfect. So you heard it there. Uh, buy the book. Awesome book plate. Um, we'll, we'll put it up in the comments following this if you didn't catch it. Um, her book uh, idea as well. Um, and we did promise that we would add books to people's bookshelves. So besides the cabinet, give us a, a recommendation of one other book um, before we sign off here. Oh, just one? That's the meanest. All right. Top, top three. I'll give you three. If you don't mind going a few minutes past an hour. Okay. Three minutes. Uh, okay, three books. Um, so if you're interested in sort of the first couple of years of the administration, I highly recommend The Second Creation by Jonathan Ginyap. It looks at all of the things that were created about the government after the passage of the Constitution, um, which I think is such an important point because it demonstrates how there's this organic development. And that's really extraordinary. If you haven't read Affairs of Honor by Joanne Freeman, you absolutely must. Um, it's not a particularly new book, but it is an absolutely field defining book and changed how I thought of political culture. Uh, one of the chapters was also inspiration for several of the songs of in Hamilton. So if you are a Hamilton fan, the material will be slightly familiar and there is no better um, sort of review than Lin-Manuel Miranda taking the material and putting it directly into a song. And the third book, oh, um, read so many lately. Um, oh, what do I want to do? What do I want to do? What do I want to do? The toughest question of the night right here. I know. It's so hard. It's so hard for historians to only pick a couple. It's just not fair. Oh, um, the, the, did I, let me see if I get the title right. I got to get the title right. Um, okay. I think it's The Problem of Democracy by uh, Andy Burstein and Oh, okay, I'm looking it up right now. Andy, we're seeing uh, the problem with democracy. It's about John Adams and John Quincy Adams and is extraordinary. Um, it was one of the best books I've read in, in a really long time. And um, I think that the way that, that yes, the problem of democracy, Andy Burstein and Nancy Eisenberg, 
Um, it's so creative. It's funny. They're writing this funny and the way that they tie father and son together is amazing. There you go, the three books, um, and I will make sure they get up in the comment section along with uh, Lindsay's uh, website. And um, so um, I'm looking forward to my now, uh, now I know I'm getting a book plate with the American Foxhound. So uh, maybe, Perfect. maybe, but um, so uh, just taking a quick view uh, view through, we don't have any more questions. So um, I'll wrap it up here. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Lindsay Sherbinsky here, um, for the author of The Cabinet. Um, graciously spending an hour of her Sunday with us. Um, feel free to check her out. She is a, um, a great presence on social media. Um, uh, she's a dog lover. Uh, you got to love that. Um, so, <laughs> um, and she only wrote one paragraph about precedence. So we're putting that to rest right here, right now. So Absolutely. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, um, if your reputation doesn't suffer too much for being part of this historian happy hour, maybe I'll invite you back uh, in a future date. Um, after um, the next few months, because I know your schedule's uh, pretty busy. But uh, once again, for Emerging Rev War, please continue to tune in. Uh, next Sunday, we talk about Daniel Morgan, one of those uh, great uh, military leaders of the Revolutionary War. Uh, we all hope everyone has a healthy, safe week, and uh, we'll see you this time next Sunday.